And so today we are beginning a journey in the book of Philippians. Uh, we will address this particular letter verse by verse. And when we take that type of study on, uh, you really get an understanding of the heart of the author, which is Paul. And he's writing to the church in Philippi. And um, we really are going to be challenged. Uh, we're going to be encouraged uh, by these truths, just like the church at Philippi was. And, and as they learned from Paul, their leader, we will learn as well. We will start in, of course, chapter 1, verse 1. The title of this series is Put It Into Practice. How many of y'all received the weekly devotional, Put It Into Practice? So many of you do. Um, now, I won't ask how many actually listen to it. We know you get it, but uh, take time to listen to it. It'll bless you, um, I pray. But look, I want you to know where that came from. So if you just flip with me over to chapter 4 in Philippians and make your way down to verse 9, and here he writes, whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. That's where that comes from. Chapter 4, verse 9, put it into practice. And I believe that with all of my heart, that if we will practice the truth of God's Word, we will have the peace of God in us. We will have the power of God, the presence of God, if we practice God's Word. So we want to put these truths into practice, and that's what we'll be working on. So we're going to begin with looking at these first six verses. But before we uh, dive into that, I want to just make some, some general uh, observations and notes about this particular letter that Paul is writing. I would say this letter to the church at Philippi is an amazing letter because Paul is writing with such joy and such passion. And, and he has not become a bitter, negative believer based on his circumstances. So his circumstances, we should note up front, and many of us know this, is that he is writing this letter from prison, from behind bars, chained night and day. He is writing a letter of encouragement to the believers at Philippi. He is not a circumstantial believer. He's not a circumstantial Christian, meaning that his circumstances cut off his relationship with God. His circumstances cause him to lose faith in God. It's not the case. And, and oftentimes, we fall into circumstantial Christianity in that we have to experience a certain type of circumstance to believe that God's at work. But the truth of the matter is God's at work in all of our circumstances. Those things that we find refreshing and those things that may be challenging to us. And Paul is demonstrating that to us in this letter. It is truly an amazing letter because his hardship is making him better, not bitter. He's full of joy and rejoicing. It overflows throughout the letter. And we can learn from that. He's thinking of others, not himself, while he waits to go on trial in, in Rome. He has an other's mindset. If we leave here today just with that, to think that I'm going to think of somebody else even though I'm going through a hard time, uh, that would be amazing. He's remembering back and he's rejoicing. He's filled up and he's expressing all the truth about God and his people and the mission at hand. And he's doing it with this amazing passion for the things of God. Now, passion if you were to define that word, it's simply an intense emotion such as love, joy, hatred, or anger. But Paul's passion is a positive passion. It is a, an enthusiasm. It's a bubbling over. It's an uncontainable, literally uncontainable appreciation for the believers at Philippi. Paul has this very unique bonding to the believers there, which caused him to live with such incredible gratitude. And that's why today... We are putting into practice gratitude is the title. Do you know how to live with gratitude? Do you know how to obtain gratitude, express gratitude, live within gratitude? Paul's going to help us understand that. 
And I really believe that his Christian gratitude is an evidence of the fact that Paul is saved and he's living in the reality of a, a, a real relationship with God. He is not just doing church, he's being the church. We've got to move beyond just doing church, doing things that we know are connected to God, and we need to be the church. And that's what we learn from Paul. That's what we see that he values so intensely. And so I want us to look at five parts today to Paul's gratitude. It'll walk us through these first six verses, which are very foundational to understanding why Paul writes the things he writes, why he's excited about the things he's excited about. And if we don't understand this, we won't understand Paul. We'll think he is a lunatic. We will think, how can anybody write this? Did he really write it? Why would you be so positive in prison? And how could you have such outlook? I don't really think this is true. But I'm telling you, this man was not just being positive. It was truly the, the desire of his heart, the reality of his life, and we should learn from it. He was a man of gratitude. Five parts. Number one. If we are going to live with gratitude as Paul did, number one, I want us to understand Christian connection from verse 1 and 2. Now, as I walk through this, I want you to take time to patiently break this down. Take it in, because this is very important. Oftentimes we read over these initial verses and we think, well, that's just an introduction to a letter, and that's just kind of what they write. But there's so much more to it. Listen to what he says. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is much more than just a fancy introduction to a letter. Here you have Paul, you have Timothy, you have all the saints, you have the overseers and the deacons. This comprises a very special relationship that cannot be found anywhere else because these people are joined together in Christ Jesus. We must note that. These are the people who are making up the body of Christ. They are saved, transformed, placed in the body of Christ. Paul and Timothy as spiritual leaders, all the saints who are growing, the overseers and the deacons, making up this incredible, beautiful, privileged place to reside relationally in the body of Christ. And we need to say, man, we are privileged. Man, we are honored to be a part of the body of Christ in this way. Paul got this. They were children of God, brothers and sisters in Christ. They each had a role in the relationship that impacted each other for eternity. And they were on mission. Paul and Timothy, he notes, they are servants of Christ Jesus. To all the saints in Christ Jesus, meaning they are transformed as well, and the overseers and deacons as well are in Christ Jesus. And Paul states in his greeting that grace and peace comes from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is important to note. So the basis of reading and understanding this amazing letter is that the author and the recipients are bonded together in Christ Jesus. They have a unique relationship. And now I want to ask you a question. I want to ask you, do you value your relationships in Christ Jesus? Do you understand the significance of your relationships with one another in Christ Jesus? What's been done for you? Where you've been placed in the body of Christ? This literally is so important. This is a big deal. This is not just when we get together some communal uh, coming together for an honorable cause that will benefit someone else. No, we are redeemed. We've been given an eternal task, and we are bonded together in Christ Jesus. We must grasp this. Michelle and I were recently having Bible study with another couple, Christian couple, and 
I was sitting there, you know, because I had worked on this message and just thinking about the dynamic of that study and the richness of it and, and the fact that it could even happen um, is the grace of God that those involved have been redeemed, sins forgiven, Holy Spirit indwelt, Word of God uh, ministering, uh, accomplishing something in the dynamic of that that only God could do that is so special, so unique in the body of Christ, you can't get it anywhere else. And I just stopped silently and I said, thank you, Lord. This is a gift from God. This is, this is you. This is about you. And it's from you. And we should learn to value Christian relationships that way. Paul did. Don't miss the Christian connection. Secondly, we must learn, if we're going to be people of gratitude, to value the valuing of Christian relationships. Watch in verse 3 what Paul says. He said, I thank my God every time I remember you. Sometimes when we think of each other, we may, you know, we may regret that we know one another. We think, oh my gosh, i got to be around that person again. Do y'all ever do that? Come on now. Don't we have to stop sometimes and put in perspective the very fact that the value of relationships comes from the Lord? And I think that when I have those kinds of thoughts, it's because my heart's not right with God. And I have to see that the value of the relationship is so important that comes from Him. And so Paul's saying, I thank my God every time I remember you. He's finding value. Do you find value in one another in Christ? We should. See, there is a geographical separation, but not a relational separation. Well, what was making Paul so grateful here? What makes a man write something like this, that he thinks, my God, every time I remember you? Well, what was he remembering? See, this is very important. When we dig back in and understand his relationship to the church at Philippi, he was remembering the activity of God. Now, he's not making the believers at Philippi God. No. He's saying, I remember the activity of God and how God has bonded us together. Let me share this with you and see if you can picture this and remember this in your mind. What Paul was remembering was how the Holy Spirit divinely guided himself and his companions to Troas, if you remember, to preach the gospel. Paul was remembering his vision of a man from Macedonia saying, come and help us. That came from God. He remembered how Lydia's heart was open to the gospel and her family was saved. He remembered how the slave girls harassing, which resulted in Paul, in the name of Jesus, dealing with this evil spirit, resulted in Paul dealing with her. Remember that? How the slave girl came, and, and she's aggravating him, coming at him, and in the name of Jesus, he deals with her. And then he remembers from that how this upset her owner and resulted in persecution and even brought about prison. He remembers the song that he and Silas sang and how the foundation of the prison was shaken. He remembered the words of the Philippian jailer who said, What must I do to be saved? He remembered the joy of baptizing Lydia and her whole family. He remembered the joy of baptizing the jailer and his whole household. He remembers those very first church services as the new believers gathered in Lydia's home that resulted in a church being started. He remembered how the church grew to have overseers and deacons. He remembered how they had had, over the past 10 years, they, the church, had been providing for his spiritual and financial support so Paul could preach the gospel around the world. Paul was remembering the gracious activity of God through him in the establishment of God's church in Philippi. And when he remembered back, he's just overwhelmed with gratefulness and, and, and thanking God. And he's thinking, God, thank you. You're the originator. You're the sustainer of the blessing of these relationships that I have. Wow. What are you grateful for that God has done in your life? Have you taken the time to think back? Does the Lord need to put you in prison so you have time to do that? 
<laughs> Anybody want to go? But think about it. Here's Paul in prison. And he's, I can just imagine him closing his eyes and thinking back about how God had led them right to where uh, they met Lydia and how they had had the vision of the man from Macedonia and how God moved and she was saved. Just that whole story, how they were put in jail and the earthquake came, the Philippian jailer was saved and all these people were baptized, the church was established. And he's thinking back and he's like, I, I didn't do this, God did this. Do you see how God did this? And now for the last 10 years, they've been supporting the ministry so I can keep going forward and sharing the gospel. You see all this activity? Paul's not, you know, sticking his chest out and going, oh, look how great I am and look what I've done. They ought to be appreciating me for what I did for them. No, 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 no. He, he, he is in, in, in a state of humility, thanking God for his activity and his sustaining work and the beauty and the value saying, thank you, Lord, for the relationships you've given me. The other day, we were talking, and Michelle brought up the fact about how Noah and Hannah met. And we were beginning to just kind of reminiscing about that, the activity of God, and how God brought the two of them together. And in so doing, we remember the first time we went out to dinner with Noah's parents and grandparents, and, and we met them. And while we were having dinner, uh, the conversation came up about how Michelle and I had always prayed for Hannah to meet the person God had for her, and been praying for years for her in that regard. And his family began to share how they'd been praying for Noah in the same way. And we began to reminisce about the activity of God. And then we talked about how then God brought Noah and God brought Noah's family. And then how Noah's families had impact in our body of Christ and how, how that has impacted other people that we know. And, and in all of that, that's just a practical example that I'm trying to give you that should cause you to think about how God's worked in your life and then you see the value of the relationships that he's brought and the impact of how God works. And we sit back and we go, this is God. This, this is God. This is not us. And when we do, we're overwhelmed with the grace of God, which brings humility, which causes us to have a heart of gratitude. And we realize this is God working. You know, the other day we, we all remembered 9-11. That is a remembering, so never to forget those who sacrificed in that and all that, that how that changed our nation. And some of that is negative. When we think about just, oh, how bad that was. Well, what Paul is thinking about is how great everything God did. So never to forget. It was positive. We need to make a list and we need to think of how God has worked so we value the church. You should trace back how you were saved. You should trace back how God works in your life. You should trace back the encouragement you received from other believers and that we're on a mission to make a difference by the preaching of the gospel and the discipling of other people and the, and the replication of how this takes place and how we are a part of this eternal work. And, and you will stop and you'll go, God, thank you for letting me be a part. So we see the understanding of the Christian connection that was in Christ Jesus, the valuing of Christian relationships as we remember back. And we thank God. Now, thirdly, I want us to see in verse 4, expressing of Christian joy. Paul said, in all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy. Now, he's praying, he's thinking of them, and he's overwhelmed with joy because of God's people. Now, this is the theme of the book of Philippians, it's joy. I thought about the story that's told of Benjamin Franklin, who in the concluding of a very stirring speech on the guarantees of the Constitution, a heckler shouted out to Frank Franklin and he said, Oh, them words don't mean nothing at all. Where's all that happiness you say it guarantees us? And Franklin smiled and he replied, My friend, the Constitution only guarantees the American people the right to pursue happiness. You have to catch it yourself. Well, people have been trying to catch it ever since. There's a restless pursuit of happiness taking place all around us. You may be a happiness pursuer yourself, 
But the problem with happiness is that it's based on happenings. And it's often short-lived. Happiness is that feeling of delight that creates an attitude of satisfaction for a moment. The problem is that happiness is not sustainable for the long term. You know this if you stop to think about it. You buy a new car, you let the new wear off, and then it's the old car that you have to get fixed. We have a car that is new to us. We've had it three and a half years. I had to take it and put a new battery in it this week because they only last three to five years, and it's now it was going out, so I had to go get a new battery and put it in. The old is worn off. The car is not new anymore. You get a new dress. You get a new computer. You get a new whatever you get, but, the, but the, it wears off. And too many people attach their happiness to circumstances and those things or to material things that change and the happiness is gone. And I really believe that's why many people outside of Christ and even those in Christ struggle with depression, despair, and disappointment in life. We look to people and events to fill us. We want those moments of happiness where we have this feeling of uh, of something of satisfaction that feels good, but it's only for a moment. God does not guarantee us happiness, but he does guarantee us peace leading to fulfilling joy. See, joy, on the other hand, is very different. It's not based on chance. It is not altered by your circumstances. It is a confidence that comes from God that is not shattered by difficult circumstances. It does not have to be fulfilled by other people. It does not have to be something that, uh, you know, somebody else guarantees us because God has guaranteed us in his presence the joy that we need. It has been said that joy is the flag that flies on the castle of the heart when the king is in residence there. The verb to rejoice appears 74 times in the New Testament. The noun joy appears 59 times in the New Testament. Paul mentions it 16 times and mentions Christ 50 times in Philippians. You say, why are you giving me all these stats and statistics here? Well, it's because joy is found in Christ alone, period. You go pursue your happiness wherever you want to do that. You can run from relationship to situation to circumstance to whatever you, wherever you want to chase it in life. But ultimately, you will only find sustaining, real, life-changing joy in Christ Jesus. This is why Paul was experiencing joy in the midst of being in a prison. Because his focus is on Christ in the gospel. This is why he'll write in a few verses. In verse 21 of chapter 1, he'll write, For me to live as Christ and to die as gain. Is he insane or is it real? I'm telling you, it's real. Circumstances were not the basis for Paul's joy. It was nothing more than, listen, Jesus Christ. Wednesday night, we were on our way home, and it was just kind of noted to me in my spirit that uh, Michelle was talking about her day. She'd had a long day. She'd, you know, gotten to work at, I don't know, 7 o'clock, and and it's just a full day. Boom, 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 all day long. Then she had meetings after work from teaching school. And then from, she didn't even eat dinner. I, I gave her a snack that I had in my office, and she ate that, and she ran to Bible study. And they did, she had Bible study, and And all that. And then we were riding home. But she was sustained with joy and strength that came from the Lord as she recalled her day of how God had worked, the things God had done, how God had worked in the ladies' Bible study and the testimonies that were shared and the activity of God that was taking place. And it just was such a reminder to me. We can give out in our physical strength, but we can be sustained in our spirit because of the activity of God that sustains us, that brings us joy. Do you know the difference? Do you understand this? 
You don't give your day because of how much you make financially. You don't give your day because of what someone does for you or how they acknowledge you. You give your day to the Lord and you acknowledge the activity of God for His glory and it brings a joy that is so sustainable there's no way to explain it outside of the fact that it's the activity of God in Christ Jesus by the Holy Spirit that brings this joy to our hearts. Does that make any sense to you? Now, some people go out, they live their day, see how much they made, put it in their bank account, go home and say, well, I made X amount, and because I made that much more, that gives me more significance, more power, more influence, and now I'm fulfilled. They get up the next day, and they say, another day, another dollar, here we go. And they go out and make some more dollars and put them in the bank. And that's what drives them and sustains them. But ultimately, it lets them down. The only thing that is sustainable is the joy and the purpose that comes from Jesus Christ. And that's why Paul, without his money, without his freedom, is living in this incredible joy in prison. <laughs> it's amazing. I mean, it's, it's, it's something to behold and take note of. Now, We've seen the understanding of the Christian connection, the value of Christian relationships, the expressing of Christian joy. But now I want you to see the establishing of Christian partnership. Verse 5. He writes and he says, because of your partnership. See, it's because. Here's the reason. Because. Because. Listen. Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. This is very key. This is very important. What Paul is saying is there's this great thankfulness for the partnership that is based on the gospel. There are a lot of partnerships in life. There are business partnerships. There are family partnerships. There are all kinds of partnerships and ways that we, basically ways we connect with other people, right, and the things that we do. It could be vacation partnerships. It could be whatever it is, whatever, where we connect with other people to do life, right? But what Paul is saying is this, is what really means something to him is that he is connected in partnership in taking the gospel to other people. It's what he's grateful for. It's the spiritual partnership in advancing the gospel. This word partnership is a word that is often translated fellowship. Unfortunately, unfortunately, we have talked about fellowship around food and gatherings where we just kind of talk and enjoy one another's presence. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. But that's really not what the, the word partnership is talking about here. When it talks about fellowship, it's talking about a partnership of a shared vision investment to take the gospel to a lost world. That is, listen, that's Christian fellowship. It's that shared vision of preaching the gospel in order to make disciples and a commitment to personal investment to bring it to reality. Where you're joining with other people to say, this is what I'm praying about. This is what I'm talking about. This is what I'm investing in. This is why I do what I do. And the other person you're sharing that with, they're in lockstep with you in your heart because that's what they want to do. And that's why they're involved. That's why they're praying for you. That's why they're both, everybody's willing to give and participate in that way. And in so doing, we know that the gospel is preached and lives are changed and God is honored. See, one of the great challenges we have is that too often the church gathers and we make it about ourselves, not the mission. We say the right things. We sing the right things. But is it really, this is the question, is it really the passion of our heart to partner for the advancement of the gospel of Jesus Christ? That's where Paul's heart is. That's why he established relationships. And we should do the same. So beautiful, because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. That partnership just got richer and richer. It didn't wane. Now, fifthly, this beautiful verse we've all quoted to each other and for each other can be understood now that we've looked at it in its context. This is number five, encouraging Christian confidence. Verse six, being confident of this, 
that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Paul had this absolute confidence in the faithfulness of God in the lives of the Philippian believers. The perfect tense of the Greek word translated being confident indicates that Paul had come to a settled conviction earlier and he was still convinced that that was true. That God would bring to completion the good work he had started. Now you and I, I don't know about you, but I I know I do. I need this verse. I need this type of conviction and this confidence to know that what God started in me, he is going to complete. Especially on days that are hard. Especially in seasons that are hard. To know that, okay, this is, this is God's work in me. It's not me for God, but God in and through me. He started it. He, he'll complete it. See, God calls us to salvation. That's what we call birth. We use the word justification. It gives us our lives in Christ Jesus. He draws us. We respond. We're saved. We're transformed. Then he continues to grow us in our salvation. We call this maturity or sanctification. This is where we become like Jesus as we follow him. Find God. Follow Jesus. God calls others to salvation through us. This is what we call service. Sanctification. This is what we call invest in others, right? We share Jesus. God completes us. On the day of Christ Jesus, we call this completion, glorification, where we live with Jesus forever. It has been well said that conversion of a soul is the miracle of a moment. Growth of a saint is the work of a lifetime. And that's where the believers were. That's where Paul was. That's where we are. That's where I am. We're all in process. But what he says here is a word we all need, and that is The reality that what God has started, God will finish. God always finishes what he starts. If you're saved, you're set apart, you're secure. There are times we fail. Temptation comes. We yield to the temptation. We sin. He convicts. He draws us back. We have to walk through that, work through that. But let me tell you something. He loves us enough to work He doesn't just immediately just push us off to the side and and disregards us. No, he works in us to draw us back because he loves us. He's our Savior. If you doubt any of that, you should read John 10, 28 and 29 that says, I give them eternal life that they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. What a beautiful promise. What what, What a securing truth for the believer that what God has started, God's going to complete. I want to share a closing story with you that makes the point about this. It's a story about Oswald Chambers. You know, Oswald Chambers to many of us is a a devotional writer, but really Oswald Chambers was not that well known during his lifetime. It was his wife that took his work and turned it into a devotion that we all now read oftentimes. You may or may not know these things about Oswald, but Oswald was a gifted artist before he surrendered to Christ in his ministry. Very gifted. But door after door would close, and the ability to use that giftedness as an artist never came to light. But during this process, God began to stir in his heart a call to become a minister. But he never could imagine that. To throw away his artistic ability and go into ministry? He he just couldn't fathom it. How he would exchange a life work and gifting of art to pursue something he had never aspired to. He wrote a friend and expressed his finality on the matter when he said, I shall never go into ministry until God takes me by the scuff of my neck and throws me in. As he struggled with what God had for him, David McCaslin, who wrote a biography about his life, relates the following story. 
He said, one evening in late autumn, unable to concentrate, Oswald left his room and walked eastward toward Queen's Park, the sanctuary of Holy Rod House. Having decided to spend the entire night in prayer, he could think of no better place to be alone than on author's seat, the highest hill overlooking Edinburgh. It took the long-legged, athletic young man less than a half of an hour to reach the top of the extinct volcano, which rose some 800 feet above the city. There, shielded from the wind, he surveyed the twinkling lights of the city and poured his heart out to God. Chambers prayed aloud, alternately thanking God and pleading with him to make his way plain. He wanted to serve him in art, to go where others could not or would not take the gospel of Jesus Christ. Oh God, he pleaded, make thy way plain to me, he prayed on top of that mountain. As the hours wore on, his soul cried out in anguished silence. Sometimes during the night, sometime during the night, according to Chambers' account, he heard a voice that actually spoke these words. I want you in my service, but I can do without you. Suddenly, the call of ministry seemed so clear. He was ready to obey, but how? More guidance was needed. Then, sometime later, a November gathering of the Christian Union brought Hudson Taylor, founder of the China Inland Mission, to the University of Edinburgh. After attending the meeting, Chambers wrote, Hudson Taylor said last night that our Lord's words, have faith in God, you know those words, have faith in God, really mean have faith in the faithfulness of God, not in your own faithfulness. Have faith in the faithfulness of God, not your own faithfulness. He would go on to write, he said, I am completely at rest now. I feel God nearer to me than ever. I will wait on him, and he will open the way. (laughs) May I say to you that in this testimony, what I see here is that Oswald's circumstances had not changed. Not a bit. What had changed was something inside of him. He became confident that he who began a good work in him, would carry it on to completion, even if he didn't understand how or why or where or what. His confidence was in the Lord, even though his circumstances had not changed. He was trusting in the faithfulness of God. That's where his faith was, in the faithfulness of God. And in so doing, let me just say, watch this. A peace came over him and a joy to say, I will wait on the Lord. Some of you today are running from circumstance to circumstance, looking for happiness. And what God wants to give you is a joy, whatever your circumstances may be. And when we begin to put our faith in His faithfulness, He gives us a joy and a perspective That even when, I believe this with all my heart, as Paul demonstrates from his own life, whatever circumstances, even prison, that we can take a pen in prison and we can write a letter of encouragement. We can think back about the activity of God and see how God works. And we can be filled with a gratitude and joy that only comes from God that is so sustaining, brings such peace. It does not matter what our circumstances are because our faith is in the faithfulness of God. And not only for ourselves, but for our other brothers and sisters in Christ, we can say what God has started, He will finish. Do you believe that? I do. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, what beautiful, what beautiful writing of truth and the living out of truth on Paul's part and his sharing of this truth with the believers at Philippi. We need this. We need this, Lord. Bring peace and settledness into the hearts of your people because we know and believe in your faithfulness. Would you do that today, God? Would you do that? today. Church, I want to ask you to stand. 
And I want to ask you if you would to respond to the work of God in your life right now as the altar is open. If you need to come for salvation, listen, that's why we are here. It's so the gospel is preached and lives are changed. Would you come? I'll be right over here to my right and your left. If you need to come and pray about your present, your future, your need for peace, or someone else that needs it, grab somebody by the hand and you come and pray. Let's do business with God for His glory. In the name of Jesus, amen.